This is going to go over the day four notes for imperialism, the imperial system. Um, as you go through the notes, you'll be able to take the notes down and um, finish out your note packet for today. We're talking about mercantilism again, which is kind of like a refresher. And remember, we said that that is making money for the mother country. So in order for a country to become wealthy, they have to accumulate gold and silver. They do that by selling more goods to other countries than they buy for them from them. So um, we're talking about England. England has to sell more goods to other countries than they buy from them. They use the colonies in order to do this. Basically, the colonies provide them raw materials and they in turn use those raw materials to make manufactured goods. The manufactured goods are then sold back to the colonies for profit. So in an essence, the mother country gets a place to get their inputs from, the raw materials, the cotton, the tobacco, the rice, the indigo, and they also get a market to sell those goods. And the colonies can't change the price. They only have to buy those things from the mother country. And colonies can't sell their raw materials to other countries. So if in the American colonies we have tobacco, rice, indigo, wheat, and other cash crops, we can only sell those cash crops to England, even though other countries like France, the Netherlands, and Spain might be willing to buy those goods from us at a better price. Alright, so the colonists don't necessarily want to abide by what um, Great Britain wants them to do. Great Britain is trying to make money from the colonies, and the colonies don't necessarily think this, fair, this is fair. They want to be able to trade with some of the other European countries. So Great Britain goes through um, a series of laws and acts that are passed to try to make the colonies behave. And these are called the Navigation Acts. So the first Navigation Act that we need to talk about is passed in 1651, and it requires that all colonial trade was to be carried on English ships. And this is a problem with colonists because, again, if they want to sell items or do business with the Spanish, with the Dutch, with the Portuguese, that stuff would have to be carried on a Spanish, a Portuguese, or a Dutch ship. And if they only can use English ships, that limits them, but also it means that they have to pay taxes and different things to England for those ships. Then in 1660, we get a Navigation Act that tightens earlier restrictions. It says that certain items like tobacco, um, and other cash crops, rice, indigo, and cotton, and eventually sugar, can only be sold to England or its colonies. So again, you're cutting out a complete market from Europe for sugar, cotton, tobacco, and these cash crops because now they can't sell, or they're not supposed to, sell to places like Spain or to the Dutch. 1663, England passes the Staple Act which says that colonial goods sold to Europe had to pass through English ports. This is a problem because now you're adding another stop to my stuff, and the only reason that you want it to go through an English port is so that you can tax it. Colonists don't think that this is fair. They are already paying taxes within the colonies. Now you're actually enforcing these taxes and making us pay more taxes on goods. 1673, we get a Navigation Act that's passed, which says duties, which is the tax again, imposed on trade between American colonies. So it used to be that if Georgia sold something to Virginia or vice versa, colonists didn't pay taxes on that because they're in the same colonies in the United States. Now, 1673, if something goes between the colonies, between Georgia and Virginia, between New York and South Carolina, there is a tax paid to the English for that item. And then 1696, we have another law being passed that gives custom officials the power to use search warrants, basically 
to board ships and come onto people's property and make sure that they're abiding by the rest of the navigational acts that are passed. And so colonists feel like this is a, an overreach. They feel like the English government is just taking all the money away from them. They can't make any profits. And they don't agree with these laws. And oftentimes they break the laws. Now you and I both know that when you break the law, there's consequences. And that's exactly what happens to colonists in the New World. So King Charles discovers that the colonists have been smuggling goods and doing business with Dutch merchants um, and the rest of Europe. So they, they're using these ships to hide the goods that they're sending to Europe. And when he finds out, he gets mad, of course. And he actually blames or puts the majority of the blame on Massachusetts Bay Colony. So because he feels that they're the ones who are starting all of this trouble, he goes in and he pulls their charter and makes it a royal colony. This is a big deal because the Massachusetts Bay participants have been able to have their own governments. Remember, we talked about town meetings and selectmen. They have made their own rules. They were re basically regulating themselves in terms of laws and things like that. And King Charles goes in and says, no, you can't do that anymore. You're a royal colony. And so now I make the rules in your colony. I'm going to appoint your governor. I'm going to appoint who's running your colony. And this is a big problem to the colonists. All of them feel like this is an overreach. And they feel bad for Massachusetts because, you know, this is who it happens to. But they also get the memo that this could happen to any one of the colonies within the New World if they weren't a royal colony and they didn't obey the rules. The king could go in and pull their charter and change the way that they do things within the colony. King Charles ends up doing, excuse me, King James, um, ends up doing at a later date is that he actually merges um, Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Rhode Island together and creates a royal province called the Dominion of New England. Um, then he forces Connecticut, that should say CT and not CN, and New Jersey to join the province and later New York. So we have um, the colonies of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, that's most of the New England and Middle Colonies, joined together called this New Mi Dominion of New England. He abolishes their colonial assemblies, you know, those town meetings um, and different self-governing things that they had in process and places all of them under the charge of a man named Sir Edmund Andros. Sir Edmund Andros enforces all of the Navigation Acts, which angers the colonists, and he has new land taxes that are um, to be imposed, and he goes a step further and offends the Puritans by saying that only marriages recognized in the Anglican Church are legal. So remember that the Puritans actually break away from the Anglican Church and um, are separatists from them. So Sir Edmund Andros is not, you know, the bee's knees in this colony. Luckily, or maybe not luckily, but there are some things going on in, in England as well. And it's not just the colonists that are mad with James II. Actual English citizens in England are also mad with James II. He's doing some things that they don't necessarily agree with. And so um, they are hoping that James II would go ahead and die and that his daughter, Mary, would become queen. She's already married to a man named William who has a kingdom of his own um, in Orange. So she's the queen of Orange. And they're hoping that William and Mary would ascend to the throne in England because England's a, a bigger country. The issue is that James II actually ends up having a son. So the way that things work in royal politics is that the son would jump the daughter in terms of line of secession. And this is a problem. They're scared um, about Catholicism taking over. James II is taking power. And they really just don't want to go through this um, new king with his son. So Parliament does something that is kind of out of the ordinary and they reach out to Mary and ask her and her husband, would she be willing to take the throne away from her dad? Um, and they say that, you know, we will support you in this rebellion. 
We will help you with whatever forces that you need. Basically, they're asking Mary and William to go to war with England so that they can take over the throne. Um, luckily for everyone involved, James II gets the memo and sees that. His days are numbered, and he just leaves the throne on his own. And William and Mary go ahead and become king and queen of England and this helps not only the English citizens who are on the European continent but also the colonists as well. So how this plays out in the colonies is that William and Mary didn't allow the old system before the Dominion of England of New England to go back into effect um, per se. Rhode Island and Connecticut are allowed to resume their previous form of government. They go ahead and go back to their individual um, governing bodies, their charter documents and things that they had before. The king issues a new charter for Massachusetts that combines Massachusetts, Maine, and Plymouth um, into a royal colony. So now we get, remember when we talked about New England, we have been talking about Massachusetts Bay Colony where the Puritans lived. Then we talked about Pure Plymouth where the Pilgrims were. And then we talked about Maine that was um, its own colony or tried to be, and then Massachusetts Bay sued. So we get that area that's Massachusetts Bay, Maine and Plymouth combined into what we feel like today is the state of Massachusetts. So the king does change some things there. Um, William, who is the new king, this is Mary's husband, appoints a governor, for the colony so there's a, a royal governor in charge that gets to run the colony and is over everything but the colonists gets to the colonists get to elect their own assemblies and counselors so it's kind of like a happy medium the king does still rule that colony he has power but he also gives some power to the colonists in selecting their assembly and their, their counselors who are going to be the ones who confer with that royally appointed um, governor. Under the system, voters had to own property, but remember we're talking about Massachusetts Bay being in here. They did not have to be Puritan. So people in Plymouth and people in Maine, if they own property, they could vote as well.